Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello, wonderful listeners. It's Shana here from Twinkle Talks EYFS here with another episode just for you. And I'm really excited about today's episode. We've got the wonderful Ang Harrod Welch here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what she's come to talk about later. But first, we're going to try a new segment before we get into our main event. This one is called Top Early Years Practitioner Hacks. So we've got a couple of cleaning ones. First of all, put sand on the floor to sweep up spaghetti messy play. Never tried that. And another one, put water on the floor to clean up rice. Oh, maybe this is where I've been going wrong all these years. They sound pretty good. Have you tried them? Another one is a good one to get children's attention if you want to transition. So you could use one, two, three, four bottoms on the floor, five, six, seven, eight, stand up straight. Nice. Have you got any other tension grabbers that work in your setting? And we've got a really good hack here for when you are doing work on the floor with whiteboards. Have the children sit on the whiteboards to stop them fiddling with them. Great idea. And all of these hacks were from you, by the way. So if you have any more, let us know. And tell us if you use these hacks and how they work. Okay, so there were some pretty interesting earlier teacher hacks. I like that. We all have a good hack, don't we? Just makes our life a bit easier. And it's one of those things that when you learn a hack, you then think, oh my God, how did I spend my entire career not using this hack? It like, it's an absolute game changer. So if you have any more, let us know. But now it's time for our main episode event. And we have got the wonderful Ang Harrod Welch here to talk to us about babies. Now, this isn't something that I've really covered yet on the podcast, so I'm really excited. And it's mainly because I've never worked with babies. I'm early years, but I've worked with children two and up. So babies is something I don't have a lot of experience in. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it, right? It's about you guys. So I brought someone in specifically to talk about the link and the connection between how babies develop in their communication and their speech and language and how they develop feeding because I didn't know there was a connection but apparently there is and the wonderful Ang Harrod who is a earlier speech therapist is going to come and tell us why so let's get started It's so great to have you on Twinkle Talk CYFS. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to me. I am so excited about today's topic because I did linguistics at university. I know it's not a speech therapist. I know I'm not trying to, you know, say I'm on the same level as you. Absolutely not. But our topic is really exciting today, isn't it? I, I think so. And it's something that doesn't get talked about an awful lot on these kinds of platforms. So I'm hoping that interesting for all your lovely early years practitioners absolutely and especially those that work with babies because we're going to be talking about babies specifically but before that Ang Harrod why don't you introduce yourself to our wonderful listeners and tell us all about you and your relationship with the earliest sector okay so uh, my name is Ang Harrod Welch I'm a speech and language therapist and I run a business called find the key speech and language therapy um, and so that business has been going for about four years. And before that, I was working in the NHS. And basically, throughout my career, I've worked um, for a long time. I did almost exclusively um, early years. So when I first qualified, a big part of my job was Sure Start. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Sure Start. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to say I'm really young or anything, but I'm really sorry. I don't know what that is. Could you? Oh, well, you'd remember, sure, either I get a blank stare or I get a, a really lovely nostalgic look because Sure Start was a really amazing scheme. So 
Um, do you remember back when we had children's centres that were actually funded? <laughs> uh, oh, well, um, yes. You know that? <laughs> well, before those came Sure Start. So um, the whole children's centre idea grew out of Sure Start. So it was um, uh, back in the 90s, um, there was, uh, Sure Start was basically put in the most deprived areas in the UK to support children and families in their early development. So um, basically, there are a lot of speech and language therapists employed there to do more like health promotion work, really working with families to try and make sure that children were getting to school with the best skills they could. Mm. And what that meant was it was a very non-traditional working model. So firstly, you got to work with all these other amazing people like play therapists and, you know, there were midwives and you I even got to uh, work with pregnant young uh, pregnant teenagers so that they could knew how to support their children's development mm. um family support workers so it was a really well-funded thing and also the whole premise of the thing was that to develop innovative practice for your area so so I got to work in that for a little while best absolute best time in my working life ever and um you got to work in people's homes and essentially whatever worked for that family is what you could do which is amazing yeah. and I got to work a lot in earlier settings because part of the remit was supporting earlier settings with their speech and language practice um, and then after that I basically went into um, quite a niche specialism which we're going to talk about in a minute so um, early years complex needs and feeding is was what my NHS specialism was so um, essentially because as we're going to talk about a lot of the feeding issues for children start at birth and so um, basically I would work with children from the point of birth or pretty near to it and then be working with them often through the whole early years period. So um, basically most of my career has been in early years um, and doing a lot of training in early years. And obviously early years is the best bit of the education system. Obviously, no <laughs> contest. And, well, from a speech and language therapist perspective, the thing is, it actually is because you are the most developmentally informed part of the education system. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> it's actually about what, where the children are at and working for where they're at, not trying to sort of put top down stuff onto their development through a curriculum, but starting with where they are and working from there. So, um, and that is exactly the same philosophy as early as speech and language therapy. So it's a very natural fit speech and language therapy in early years to be honest I love it I love it and you know what I'm really excited to have you on because when we were talking about you coming on the show and discussing you know what kind of topics we could talk about when we started talking about babies and feeding I had absolutely no idea that feeding had such an impact on speech and language and mm. I thought gosh I find this really interesting so I'm hoping that my listeners are going to find it interesting too that you know um, speech therapists actually you work with children in t in terms of their feeding challenges and their feeding development so can can you tell me what why do speech therapists actually do that okay so not many people know that speech therapists work with feeding at all no. um, and they certainly don't know that we work with feeding from baby sort of age or babes in arms and it is quite a small niche within speech therapy so not every speech therapist will be working in that area but basically uh, speech therapists are interested in everything that goes on in the mouth and in the throat and in your cognitive processes that inform those things so um, when you start digging around in speech therapy there's actually quite a lot of very interesting specialisms within that area of your anatomy basically we've got a very natural affinity we're looking at the mouth anyway um, from a speech and language perspective so it kind of made sense on some level that we would also be looking at the other skills that are taking part in the same part of your anatomy but also there's a lot of communication skills wrapped up in your feeding particularly your early feeding so the kind of children who are born with feeding problems are often children who are um, either very premature or ones who have quite complex medical issues and maybe both of those things and so a lot of those children, if you think about typical feeding development, when you are bottle feeding or breastfeeding a baby, there's loads of communication going on between you non-verbally. Um, you're reading the signals. Do they need winding right now? Um, do they need to have a, have a pause? Those things. For most babies, when they're born, most of the feeding activity is the responsibility of reflexes from the brain. So once they start sucking, they can't stop. Um, those things come very naturally. So if um, people listening, if you're feeding babies, you'll know that very young babies, um, if you touch any part of their face, they'll turn to root towards your finger, for example. So that's a feeding oh. So very uh, medically complex babies um, or babies born early, they're often, they've missed out of that period. They're often very unwell during that reflex period of their feeding development. 
And so when by the time they are ready to start feeding, they've often missed that reflex period when their reflexes would have established those skills for them. Right. So it becomes even more important that the feeders can read the baby's cues very, very well. Because mm. babies who are vulnerable like that, their feeding can be a very stressful experience if we don't handle it well. Right. So we're often looking, basically, we're looking to read. The reason speech therapists are involved is because we are looking to teach people to read the signs the baby is showing that they're ready to feed. And the little subtle stress cues and cues in their body and face that are going to show us, hang on, this is all getting a bit too much for me. So you have to be a very skilled reader. We call it reading the feeding. Mm. So um, you have to be a very skilled reader of children's communication. Because if we get that period in their feeding development wrong and we teach them that feeding is a bit scary and overwhelming, we can lay uh, the groundwork for quite a lot of long term feeding issues. So as people who, uh, as part of our training, are skilled at assessing children's communication and also teaching other people how to read that communication, it's actually a very natural fit um, feeding assessment in those babies and the speech and language side of things. It's so interesting because although I have been in early years for over 10 years, I have never worked with babies. So this is a new a new uh, space for me. I've done two and up. And so I, I do feel maybe a little bit nervous to uh, maybe support babies because I like you say, there's so many important things that you, you have to keep an eye on. But the thing for me is they can't tell me mm. when something's wrong. And I think that's a big fear for me. But then there's you saying that actually, you know, there are other forms of communication. It's just, you know, learning it, you know? Absolutely. It's just like a language sort of in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and once you once you can read it, you can become, you know, oftentimes the other thing about babies who are medically unwell is they often get a lot more f- different feeders than a well baby because they're often having lots of different nurses and things. So the potential for having multiple people who are not quite great at reading those cues is much bigger. Um, And so it becomes much more important to get everybody really tuned in. But once you can speak that language, they're actually, you know, it's very individualized to the baby, um, but you can learn their, their little stress cues, their signs that they're ready to go on. And it's about acting very quickly on those things because in, in premature babies and and well babies, oftentimes you don't get a big signal and you don't get that much time before um, something, you know, if they're not very happy in their feeding, it will tend to impact on other things quite quickly. So it's a very subtle dance, that uh, communication process for those early feeders. Well, that kind of brings me on to my next question then. What kind of communication is going on during feeding? Uh, are you talking about unwell babies now or are you talking about more typically developing babies? Oh, <laughs> both, please. I didn't know there was a difference. This is this is why it's great to have you. <laughs> Tell us both, please. Okay. Well, I mean, they're not so different, but the, the signs are probably you're looking for are probably more subtle. I mean, so basically, first up, you're looking for your cues that children are ready to feed. So, you, you know, if any if anybody's ever fed a baby, they'll know that by the time they're actively crying for a feed, um, they've probably been hungry for a while. Right. Of, oftentimes, by the times they're really crying out for a feed, they're getting pretty dysregulated. So certainly with the poorly babies, we are looking to try and step in and start a feed before they get to that point because they get pretty physically dysregulated. And that will happen to all babies. But if um, the consequences of that in a more poorly baby, you know, can't get an oral feed for that feed because now they've become so dysregulated and their respiratory systems gone a bit haywire. So basically we're looking for signs that the babies are starting to shift and suck and root. So um, sucking or kind of turning, looking for food. So quite subtle signs. Uh, look, just look like I'm getting ready for something to happen here basically is what you're looking for right. um, and for most babies who are typically developing if you're not in that exact window they can kind of cope with that the system can cope with mum's turned up a bit late to feed me right now <laughs> but some of the premature babies can't do that so you're looking for quite subtle signs that they're getting ready I'm, I'm woken up because my body's told me I'm ready for something essentially because premie babies like all babies spend a lot of time sleeping um, and so when they're waking up for something, it's because they're, you know, their body's telling them they need to do something. Um, and then once that when they're feeding, the kind of skill, the kind of things we're looking for. I mean, if you're breast or bottle feeding, you are subconsciously looking at that baby's face. They're looking at you or, you know, are they getting sleepy? That can be a sign in preemie babies. Um, them getting sleepy can be a sign they're actually a bit stressed by the feeding and they're kind of just trying to shut down a little bit you know the way the way children are shifting against you when you're holding them that kind of thing they're all little subtle cues that I'm finding this feed okay or not and in in premature babies um, because they don't have such good control over their bodies they'll often show quite subtle stress cues so for example splaying out their fingers um, in a little startle 
so that startle reflex will kick in you know like when you jump yeah yeah um that's the reflexive pattern in your body so the little startle um sometimes you'll see a very subtle color change in their skin because their oxygenation levels are so interlinked with their feeding and little uh, facial grimaces things like that so really subtle and those things will also happen in well babies but they've just got a much bigger window of tolerance basically you know they, they can cope for a while if that feeding interaction is not kind of perfect but we need to be right on the money for our more unwell babies basically yeah definitely goodness it's really important isn't it goodness mm. so what kind of impact does either like you say a successful uh, feeding development or or maybe a more complicated one what's the impact maybe in later early years life uh, does it affect their speech does it affect um, their social skills what kind of impact does actually this feeding development have well it, it can do so you know i wouldn't want to scare everybody not every preemie baby is going to have a load of feeding issues no of course um, but if you've struggled earlier on with you know the more medically complex you are the more likely feeding is to be difficult for you because feeding is the culmination of lots of different things going on in your very skilled process and so if you have struggled quite significantly early on you've often been tube fed for a period and sometimes this group of children really struggle to get off their feeding tubes for various reasons now we're going to talk about tube feeding in a bit. Um, so for some children, you know, they can be long term tube fed. So in lots of premium for medically complex babies, there's an expectation that that tube feeding happens for a period and then they establish feeding. But it's not a terribly easy road for a lot of children. So, you know, you might get children coming to your setting still being tube fed to a degree. Um, or fully but also these children are quite highly at risk for developing more sensory based difficulties and food aversions things like that and those can definitely turn up in your early years population so because essentially the brains often weren't really ready for the sheer amount of sensation they were being exposed to so a lot of the interventions in more complex baby populations are around controlling the environment making it quiet making it uh, dark essentially trying to recreate the womb <laughs> as much as we can right. because essentially their brains aren't ready for that information and then we we do things to stick a load of tubes in their mouths and you know things we have to do but actually things that are quite aversive yeah and so there can be long-term consequences for that in terms of the babies you know that we've often changed the way that they take in sensory information particularly through their mouth because our mouth and our hands are the most densely uh, receptor rich for touch information. Oh, really? Mm, yeah, yeah. So just touching my lips now, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you watch a baby feed, they've got a really interesting reflex to do with this uh, neurological organisation. So you've got very, you've got loads and loads of touch receptors in your mouth and your hands. So if you see babies feed, they will often be sort of pumping their hands at the same time right and that is a reflex from monkeys essentially so monkeys do the same thing and it's because when they're feeding they need to hold on to their mother's fur and equally if you see quite young babies doing more messy play with their hands or food play you'll often see their mouth going and it's because these are two very uh, a lot of this information essentially is getting passed between these areas of your brain so the hands are very important to the mouth in terms of feeding this is madness sorry my <laughs> I know my listeners can't hear me or see me sorry um but my mouth is just agape in like <laughs> what this is crazy like I didn't know the sensory processing and and the mouth and you know it all of course it does now I think about it it's one of the five senses for a reason of course it's going to be really important but yes. it's like you say touch is a is a sense for the mouth as well and like you say, with feeding, if you do think about it, there's so many things going on because I've been guilty of looking at videos on TikTok of cute babies trying new foods. Oh, and yeah. they're just, they're the cutest videos and they pull the funniest faces and they look like they are not enjoying it at all. But then they go for another one. And it's just because they're processing all of the sensory explosions that are going on in their in their bodies right now right absolutely yeah feed feeding and eating is one of the most sensory rich things you're going to do in your life there's smells there's taste texture all these things you're integrating a lot of um, hand-to-mouth skills a lot of physical skills involved there's social stuff going on I mean it is a seriously learning rich activity and so if your brain has come into the world not quite ready for all this stuff it's it's very common to have knock-on effects on feeding and communication later on and then also a group of children who have can have similar needs from a slightly different basis is autistic children can sometimes struggle for similar reasons in, in as much as they, they're often struggling with the sensory aspect yeah. of feeding so um, they can come sometimes your children who have had a lot of tube feeding 
in quite poorly children, they can present from a feeding perspective in similar ways to some of the autistic children. Mm. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So I think you picked on something really important there, actually, that personally, I've never had that experience, but I know a lot of our listeners will have or might be getting some children in the future in their settings, in their nurseries, in their baby rooms that are being tube fed. Mm. So how do we as practitioners support tube fed children and babies? Yeah, so the first thing is to not panic. <laughs> oh, are you sure? Because I'm already, I'm sweating just thinking about it. Like these these children need my help, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, as as I think I've probably got across already. This is a really complex area, and so nobody should be expecting you to dabble with this stuff without the appropriate professional support. That's of the course, question. yeah, yeah. So the, there's a few things to understand about tube feeding, just to give you some context, really. So the first thing is understanding the reasons why children might be on them, because it imply different things in terms of what you can do to support. So the first thing, some children, I haven't really talked about this so far, but some children literally have unsafe swallows. So the neurological control of their swallow just isn't sufficiently good to um, to protect their airway. So they'll be breathing in some of what they're eating or drinking. Right. We've got aspiration. That's pretty rare uh, in, in an average early years environment. Um, but for those children, they've got a tube and it may well be lifelong for to protect their airway basically and so for those children it's more about learning the skills of tube feeding and oftentimes if a child is there over a feed time your community nursing team will come out and help you with that stuff they'll come out and train you make sure you're safe to do all those things and then but the other reasons children can have tube feeds are sometimes children are safe to eat but they can't um, maintain their calorie intake either because they just can't feed for volume they just fatigue very quickly sometimes or sometimes they've got um, a really high calorie need because they've got a condition of some kind and so they just can't possibly eat enough um, and again and in that case it's probably the dietitian who's going to be important in terms of making sure they're getting enough nutrition and then the third thing which is perhaps more of a speech therapy thing is children who are tube dependent for these kind of sensory aversive kind of based reasons they've had negative experiences around their mouth and they've you know so they, they can't eat even though everything is technically working in terms of their mouth and their swallow So those are the children who we will often ask you to do your intervention with. And for those children, it's about being very low pressure. One of the big thing problems that happens is when people sometimes decide they're going to get a child eating. (laughs) Um, And so children are often very, particularly those children, are often very sensitive to pressure around eating and um, implicit pressure um, around eating. And so actually... There's two big areas you can really help with, and that's just being low pressure. (laughs) And then also um, a lot of those children, a lot of the therapy is based around sensory play and food play. The last area and the biggest area where early years environment is actually perfect to support children's feeding is with these sensory aversive type behaviours. Because for all the reasons I mentioned, these connections between the uh, mouth and the hands, one of the big therapy interventions that we are doing is desensitizing the hands to being in food and other sensory experiences. You'll often find these children are very aversive to stuff on their hands and sometimes the rest of their body too. Um, and so because you guys are an environment with so much sensory stuff going on, it's actually a perfect environment for working on children, just quietly building tolerance of those types of sensations. And um, so you might well find that a therapist would come in and give you advice about how to use your existing sensory activities to help children sort of desensitize to those experiences because essentially children very sensibly if they can't touch it with their hands they won't put it in their mouth a lot of the time so because their brain's kind of using their hands as a bit of a safety mechanism does that feel okay to me before I stick it in my mouth so I know that most earliest practitioners you have the opposite problem of trying to stop children putting things in their mouth yeah I was gonna say like I'm not sure my children got the memo of that (laughs) they try and put everything in their mouth (laughs) but a lot of the children I, I I used to work with uh, with feeding issues they often are very naturally suspicious of their mouth those touch receptors and all the other receptors you've got in your mouth being overwhelmed with information and so we often spend a lot of time building their comfort level with their hands first um, and letting them decide when it's time to put things in their mouth so the sensory play is something that you can really do and be supportive of in early years because you guys are really the experts in that it's perfect. See, see why I think early years is such a great um, environment Aww. for scent. <laughs> oh, stop. You're making us blush, Ang Harrod. Stop. No, keep going. <laughs> but also there's a lot of communication going on during those interactions. And you guys are trained in those. Essentially what children with feeding problems need you to be is child-led. And you already do that in, in early years uh, because they need you to read their cues and to, to respect what they're telling you or showing you that they can cope with. 
And so it's exactly the same principle that you're using to develop their early language skills. Oh, wow. That's really comforting to know. Like, especially from someone who hasn't had experience in, you know, feeding development and, and babies, actually. That makes me feel like, oh, yeah, no, maybe I could I could do that. I could help. Good. Well, it's the same. It is the same skill set, but just drill down. It looks different, but it's the same, exactly the same developmental principles. But also the steps are slower. And we're only going as fast as the child gives us permission to move. And oftentimes that is really, really slow in feeding, obviously not in typical feeding development, but in, you know, when you've got difficulties with feeding development. And so one of the other things is to take the pressure off yourself as a practitioner that you're going to kind of fix this problem because they are very slow to unfold these feeding issues. And so a big part of it is kind of you being comfortable with that, what feels like a lack of progress. But the child all the time is taking things in, deciding if you're a safe person. Um, desensitizing to the smells of lunch and all these things that are going on you just have, sort of have to trust that when you create that environment that's child-led around food that they will they will follow when they're ready really yeah I love that I love that so what kind of what kind of myths are there about feeding and communication then I feel like we've covered a lot of things that we should know mm. what are things that we think we should know that we shouldn't know it's actually got nothing to do with it <laughs> well um I think people often assume that if you don't eat you're not going to talk which is uh, I see that that's a logical kind of conclusion to come to and it is often true that children with the more severe feeding issues are often the ones who are also struggling with the communication. But it is not necessarily the case. So we've got slightly different motor pattern areas for the kind of motor patterns you use for eating and the kinds that you use for talking. And so um, technically, um, you don't see many children like this, but you can have children who are struggling with their eating, their talking and vice versa. So there's not that straight line association you might think. Oftentimes, if children are struggling with both, it's because there's some underlying thing that's causing both problems, like neurological problems or sensory problems. So that's the first thing. So people say it to me all the time. Well, if he's not if he's not eating, he's not going to talk. That's not necessarily the case. I think one of the big things that parents bring in terms of myths is that everybody else this age is already eating. You know, everybody else is not having any problems. Everybody else is not having any communication problems because literally nobody posts about their child's feeding issues on Facebook. You know, and so. There's this myth that everybody else's child is eating, you know, they can eat neatly and they're feeding themselves and they, you know, they can eat avocados and, you know, whatever you put in front of them. (laughs) Everybody else thinks everybody else's child is doing great. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah. Actually, feeding issues are much more common than we think. So we've been talking about feeding issues in much more complex babies, but actually there is a proportion of children who are otherwise typically developing no problems at all, but, you know, they'll have a tendency towards struggling to accept new foods and things like that. So, you know, things are actually very common. Um, and so a lot of the stress I find comes from people feeling alone with it. Um, but actually there's, you know, there's many, many more, many, many more people being affected than you think. There's also one of the myths that's also helpful, I'm going to mention it in passing, is some people feel when it comes to feeding, and I hope this isn't true in early years anymore because we view children differently now, but um, that kind of viewpoint that, you know, children are not eating because they're trying to kind of gain control over you or to kind of test you in some way. A behavioural problem is not a terribly helpful way of framing things. No. You hear that from people. Um, it's sometimes in early years, uh, often outside, you know, relatives and things like that. And so, you know, children, if they are controlling food, they've got good reasons for it. Um, it's another way of communicating. There's something about that experience that's scary to them. You sometimes do get people who have just, just decided you're going to make the child eat, and it's really, really unhelpful for various reasons. So that's a myth. And also the idea that children will eat when they're hungry is not true for some of these more complex children. Oh. Yeah, so you will often, like, you hear that a lot with tube-fed babies, oh, give them to me, they'll, they'll eat when they're hungry. Um, but, you know, some of these children are so aversive the experience of eating is so aversive and also sometimes what tube feeding can do usually they try and get to the point where they they give a tube feed a bit like a meal with a gap in between but when children are really poorly sometimes they actually their stomachs can't tolerate that so they're actually yeah. getting fed all the time so a lot of the children who are tube fed have never really experienced being hungry they don't know what that is right so you know even if um, they were sort of ragingly hungry <laughs> They wouldn't necessarily associate putting something in their mouth to solve that problem. And even if they did, that can be so scary that they would still rather go hungry. And also for some of your autistic children, um, the signals that are coming from their system to their brain to tell them they're hungry are not, on a sensory level, not terribly effective. So they literally don't know they're hungry. So, you know, that whole, for most people, 
it'll hold that when you're hungry you'll eat something but actually the more complex children that's not the case and that can cause a lot of stress I hear parents say used to that to me all the time somebody oh they'll eat when they're hungry and like a lot of parent blaming gets wrapped up in feeding you know you must be doing something wrong to have this level of problem and it's just not yeah that's not terribly helpful no gosh there's so many young Harry this, I'm sorry yes no <laughs> well, don't apologize this is the information we need <laughs> the other thing that I think is a complete myth that parents talk to themselves with is that there is a best way of weaning babies ah uh, yes so the old you know baby led or or kind of more spoon kind of fed scenario and the truth is most babies do well with a bit of both and it, actually it's about choosing the approach that helps your baby and so, you know, there is no right or wrong way of doing that. Um, we often will tweak that stuff. A more complex baby sometimes needs something specific. But, of course. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just another way to make parents feel guilty, to be honest with you. So um, <laughs> whatever your instinct is as a parent and whatever works for your child is, you know, fed is definitely best. So, you know, that can be really unhelpful. You're not kind of ruining your child's oral development or something if you use a spoon to feed them with. The only thing I would say is that sometimes pouches can, uh, if, if you're giving a lot of food sort of straight from the pouch that's often not quite so helpful so because children need to learn the business of getting food off a spoon or out of a cup those are actually developmental skills they need to learn and so yeah they're in the development matter statements aren't they yes yes and so if you're basically squeezing food directly into them firstly it can bypass their cues because kind of you you are taking control of that but also they're not learning some of those skills that they need um they actually take quite a lot of practice kind of holding a cup still keeping it still tipping it um, getting a spoon into your mouth loading the spoon those are all skills they need to learn and so pouches aren't like they're fine for the occasional thing but they, they shouldn't really be kind of your regular way of feeding that and then my last myth and the whole wait and see thing when it comes to feeding problems or communication needs you will often get a lot of people trying to reassure parents that oh well they'll go out of it, it's no problem just wait and see and just like with um, communication early intervention for feeding is really important particularly if something sometimes feeding issues are, uh, in the child are relatively minor but if the parents worried about them they can really uh, escalate out of control yeah, they pick up on it don't they absolutely um, and very quickly feeding issues spiral and so if getting a little bit of help earlier on is going to help that family dynamic around feeding to stabilize then that's what needs to happen so and it can be difficult to get support sometimes and so it's really important that people don't kind of falsely reassure either you know it's kind mm. of neither be too worried nor too yeah. about it but if basically if it's causing whoever the person feeding the child is stress then you know it's better nipped in the bud really in no I think that was great I didn't know there were so many myths my goodness but thank you now we're, I feel so educated now it's great it's great so speaking of education obviously you've moved on from that in your speech uh, language therapy uh, career so how does all of this kind of fit into later on how does how does the work that you've done is it university you said that you did this on and, and, and others uh, yeah so um, well I did it mostly as a postgraduate thing so back when I trained um, you didn't do re- you didn't really do anything but the absolute basics in terms of speech and uh, in terms of swallowing uh, when you originally trained and they do do a bit more now but most people do post-grad training how does it impact your work now with children yeah so now mostly what I do is work in mainstream schools and what's interesting about being a feeding uh, specialist therapist is that you are trained quite differently to a lot of speech therapists in terms of um, you are trained to look at the whole body in terms of how it influences what's going on in the mouth and so and I think this is really pertinent to your early years kind of audience basically what you see going on in the mouth is a reflection of the skills in the rest of the body so if you think about what's going on in your mouth is fine motor skills so all the things you do with your tongue and your jaw and your lips are fine motor skills just like when you're doing things with your hands if you do not have you wouldn't expect a child who hasn't got kind of quite foundational gross motor skills to be doing super specific things with their hands you wouldn't expect them to have a pencil and write if they couldn't it up for example um and yet people expect children to do things with their mouths when they don't have the gross motor skills all the time so in order to control our jaw and our tongue and our lips we need a certain amount of core stability i always look for sitting as a kind of good starting point so there's a reason that you typically developing babies will usually start moving on with their weaning um or starting weaning around the age of six months and it's not a coincidence that coincides with about the same time they sit 
Hmm. That's because you can't control your jaw on the level you need to until you've got the ability to sit. No way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my, my mind is, you know what? I've got lots of friends who have just had babies. If they weren't <laughs> listening to this episode already, they're going to now. I'll be like, guys, you need to listen to this. Nature is a really clever thing. So not only, if it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? The children, until you can sit, you don't, you know, your all your um, skills with your arms for reaching and bringing things to your mouth develop at around the same time. Hmm. That makes sense, actually, that you wouldn't, start getting onto solids until you you can sit up and reach for things and bring them towards your mouth actually right, because yeah. the body's kind of saying you need all this skill set at the same time for feeding so um and then equally things like when children move on and they're chewing um we need to be able to i'm getting really technical now but your tongue needs to be able to cross the midline in your mouth do a little figure oh yes in. i i know about that i find motor skills crossing the midline i get that bit if you if you have a child who's not doing that in their play they're not reaching across their base of support for a toy. They can't coordinate both sides of their body. They're not going to be able to do that in their mouth either because they haven't got the sort of neurological <laughs> skills on a gross motor level. And so uh, what that's got to do with mainstream environments is that I'm always looking at children's gross motor skills to see whether they're really... So some children uh, get really good at kind of covering for gaps in their gross motor integration. But actually, it has a knock-on effect on, you know, when it comes to mainstream school, it might be their concentration, their listening, that kind of thing. And it's because actually it's their bodies that are struggling. It's not really their attention. So we often go in at that speech and language level or attention level, but actually they're missing skills that they needed in their body. So that's something that as with somebody with a feeding background, I'm always thinking about that in schools, because sometimes even though the outward behaviour that they're struggling with is a speech and language thing, Sometimes it's not the speech and language therapy they need. It's an, an OT or a physio um, to work. And similarly, um, the sensory piece as well is something that you don't traditionally get trained in in speech therapy, but it's very uh, pertinent for feeding work. And similarly, if children are not able to take in the relevant amount of information from their environment and from inside their bodies and then work out what to do with that sensory information, it becomes very hard to feed it also becomes very hard to again concentrate they still uh, so you don't get into trouble whilst you're listening to a book you know doing all those skills that we associate with kind of getting ready for school they're dependent on a certain amount of basic sensory integration ability and gross motor skill so your sensory motor skills absolutely are the foundation for speech and language and for everything else that comes after and I think that we often don't pay enough attention to that. It's interesting seeing the year group of children who perhaps have come through after lockdown and maybe haven't had so much gross motor activity because people are saying, oh, they can't sit still. They're struggling with their learning. And that makes a lot of sense to me because they haven't got that foundation of sensory motor integration. So important. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes you kind of we, we think speech and language is fundamental. And obviously, I think that because I'm a speech therapist. But actually, speech and language. It's the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. From a lot of other skills. But oftentimes, it's, you know, we, we go in looking at the speech and language level. And as a feeding therapist, that training has really helped me understand that sometimes it's it's not the speech and language level you need to go in at to solve the speech and language problem. Amazing. I mean, I can literally <laughs> talk to you all day about this, but I have to stop because we've actually got some guest questions. Okay. So the first one, how can you encourage babies or toddlers to try a range of textures and flavours when they often refuse to try new things? You're kind of touching on this. We have food play and sensory play is your short answer on that. I love it. That was quick. Right. Get some spaghetti <laughs> out, stick it in an activity tray. The hands are the gateway to the mouth. Yeah. There's a really nice resource people might be interested in. There's a website called the Infant and Toddler Forum. If you go into the parent bit... There's a whole section about, I could easily do a whole podcast about that fussy eating phase, but um, there's a whole whole nice resource for parents about fussy eaters and when that fussy eating becomes a bit more extreme and it's got some lovely resources in it. So I would start there. I love it. Thank you. So informative. Next question. This is a This is an interesting one. Okay. What exercises are available to help improve swallowing that parents and practitioners can do with a child? We haven't really talked about that, have we? No, we haven't. I haven't talked about that. There aren't any. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. So swallowing is under your um, subconscious neurological control. Yeah, I thought it was like an automatic. Is it? It is automatic. On the swallowing front, if there's literally a, a swallowing problem, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We influence that with things like changing our food textures and temperatures and stuff. But in terms of exercises for swallowing, 
there aren't really any. Um, now, in adults, are, when they've had a stroke, that's a little bit different for various reasons. So if you, I remember doing this at university. Yes. So that's a little bit different for various reasons. But, you know, basically, apart from anything else, if you can get a baby to do an exercise for their swallowing, then, you know, <laughs> you're a better woman than me. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for swallowing, I wonder if that person's asking a question more from a feeding perspective, because essentially the short answer to this question is that the best way to learn to feed is by feeding. So I wonder if what that person's thinking of is more like aura motor exercises. There's not a great basis for doing aura motor exercises for feeding or for communicating, to be honest with you. It's actually quite a controversial area in speech therapy. Now, there are reasons I will very occasionally do some aura motor but I would only be doing them if a therapist has told you to so generally speaking there's nothing kind of like off the shelf you could learn to help with those things because basically the way the brain's organized is if you want to and there are always exceptions to a rule but as a general rule if you want to get better at feeding you do it by feeding and if you want to get better at talking you do it by talking that's how the brain's organized so for swallowing definitely there isn't anything for children you may very occasionally see aura motor exercises for eating specifically but even then not very often so there's nothing generic I can sort of point you to sorry that's fine that's fine sometimes there's never there's not an answer isn't there and that's important to know because I bet some people might be thinking oh there's got to be something that we're doing I'm at fault because I don't know the exercise and it's actually well no there is no right answer no no. and to be honest if you're at the level of needing to ask those questions you've probably got quite a complex need on your hands because there are things you can do whilst a child's eating to feed them in slightly different ways that will challenge their muscles a little bit but that's super specialist so it's really hard to give you general answers about that no that's fair enough fair enough okay last question Mm -hmm. breastfeeding and bottle feeding Mm -hmm. is there a a difference does it impact or not are they all right are they the same um they are slightly different in terms of how the baby deals with these things in their mouth there's a difference in how the tongue works basically to get the milk off right so with breastfeeding it's more of like a, a stripping motion so if you've ever seen um, a picture of um, a mum's nipple in the mouth, it actually is quite a stretchy thing. A oh, a lot of my friends have told me that their experiences of breastfeeding. I, I'm, yeah. The baby's tongue is essentially kind of um, like stroking along the length of that to kind of get the milk. Yeah. Off. With a, a teat on a bottle, it's more of a, like a compression action. Oh, yeah. They are very different movements, aren't they? They are quite different movements. And also the flow of milk is quite different. That's the other thing that makes a big difference between the two because bottles tend to let out a set amount of milk whereas breasts are more responsive to the baby and so in terms of the kind of the letdown of the milk and that kind of thing um, and the different types of milk you get over a feed very interesting so yes there's a t- difference between the two which is partly why some babies will struggle if you're switching between the two um, most typically developing babies will sort themselves out they'll work it out uh, but I know it's a time that can cause a whole lot of stress for people when they're trying to you know finish maternity leave and and now they need to get their child onto a bottle um, but most babies will sort it out sometimes you're better off just going onto a cup by the way depending on how old you you know if your baby's quite close to cup age anyway sometimes you're gonna like this is just a completely different skill set i'll just go on to something like a doidy cup or sometimes that's the case if you that's the kind of thing your health listing team should be able to help you with or sometimes they have lactation consultants and stuff that can help you i love it this has been so interesting i've learned so much i could i know i can't keep you forever i shouldn't i shouldn't but <laughs> i've honestly feel like i've learned a lot so now and Harrod, it's time for some fun are you ready for some fun yes, yes. okay <laughs> So at the end of every episode, what I do with my guests is I play a education, you know, would you rather kind of teacher edition, but it's going to be speech therapist edition today for you. Okay. Yeah. Especially for you. Uh, But the first question is always the same. Would you rather tea or coffee? Coffee every time. But honestly, as long as it's got caffeine in it, (laughs) I'll take a tea if it's all you're offering. As long as there's that caffeine hit, I'll take it. (laughs) Preferably very strong black coffee would be my... Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Question number two. Would you rather, this is brilliant, would you rather change a nappy or do food play? Food play for me every time. This this sounds like a no-brainer, but for me, I'm hesitant because I'm one of those people that 
I, like I don't like the the feel of cotton wool. I don't like the feel of velvet. You know when you wash the dishes and then like you accidentally feel a bit of food in the water. Like I'm just I'm one of those people. I yeah. think I'd rather change a nappy. You're not alone. A lot of people really hate doing food play. Um, it's a, it's a significant barrier in therapy. Uh, sometimes you'll get a parent who just cannot bear doing food play. They can't stand it themselves. And so yeah, a lot of people would rather change a nappy than do food play, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> It just sounds really weird me saying it because I really don't like changing nappies either, but <laughs> it depends what day. It depends what day. But thank you for being so uh, non-judgmental of my weird <laughs> my weird finger habits. Well, that's so common. That's so common. I can't tell you because your hands are very sensitive, you see. Uh, now I know. Now yes. I know. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, would you rather remind someone to use a visual timetable or write a report that nobody reads? Oh dear. Uh, sadly, these are both very commonplace if you're a speech therapist. <laughs> I was going to say. Honestly, oh. if you want to make a speech therapist very happy and it takes almost no effort, guys, use your visual timetable. <laughs> I think I'd rather remind somebody to use a visual timetable because at least I wouldn't have spent two hours writing the report. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And I think early years, we're quite good at using visual timetables, I think. It's very naturally ingrained in what we do. You're pretty good. You're pretty good. But um, it, there's kind of thing that really slips off the agenda easily, I find. So, yeah, make your speech therapist happy. Oh, we will, Angharad. We will. Oh, it's been such a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much for your expertise. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm sure our listeners are going to want to explore this and learn more because there's so much more we would, we could cover. We, you know, we could literally sit here for hours. Mm. Um, where can people find you? What projects are you doing so that our listeners can, you know, reach out to you if they have more questions? Yeah. So um, I'm all over social media. So my business is called Find the Key Speech and Language Therapy. And that's what I go by on Facebook. Um, I also have a Facebook group as well, which you can find from my page. Um, on Instagram, I'm Find the Key SLT, Speech and Language Therapy. Find the Key SLT one, and I'm also on LinkedIn. That's a good place to catch me. So I post really regularly and blog on all these. You do. I have um, a earliest project that I'm in the middle of rehashing a little bit and relaunching. So um, look out for that because I'll post about that. That's more of a speech and language project. If you've got any feeding questions, uh, general feeding questions, I'm always very happy to. Um, answer them uh, because it is a really fascinating area it's something that I don't talk about quite so much on social media because it's quite a hard topic to explain simply in a post oh you've done very well today oh thank you um <laughs> but I'm, I'm always very happy to answer your questions particularly your kind of fussy eaters that kind of thing those are questions that we can get into so if anybody's got a feeding question specifically they're very welcome to come into the group Facebook group that's where I encourage people to ask questions um and yeah and then you can follow on and see i'm always doing bits and pieces webinars and um various things through my website so follow me on social media and then you'll find out all about it i love it i love it in the description of this episode as well what i'll do is i'll put all of your social media handles in as well so that people can just it's a click away they don't have to search it's just there for them i love it awesome oh you are amazing thank you so so much for, for spending time with me today i i hope we get to speak again and i look forward to everything that you do in the future Oh, I can talk about speech and language related things for hours. Yay! So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that would be brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, Ang Harrod. Thanks for having me. Well, there we have it. I don't know about you, but I learned so much from listening to Anne Harrod and she's just this fountain of knowledge. And I really only feel like we've scratched the surface, especially because babies is not really a topic I have covered yet and I really want to. So if you have any other topics to do with working in the baby room and working with really, really young children and there's something that you want us to talk about or you have people that have experience that they'd like to share, let us know. You know where we are. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. I mean, we're pretty much everywhere. So find us and just give us a message. Anyone is welcome on this podcast. You don't have to have X amount of followers. It's not, it's not that. This podcast is about real practitioners, real people in the real job. <laughs>
And that's exactly what you are. And Twinkle will also be sending out a monthly newsletter highlighting the latest news, resources and activity ideas specifically for practitioners who work with children under two. How cool is that? So if you would like to sign up to this newsletter, it's free and it won't sign you up for a Twinkle membership. It's just the newsletter. Follow the link in the episode description. How exciting. So until the next time, I hope you have a lovely week. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.